good afternoon to those of you who are joining us from the UK or another European time zone. Um, my name is Duncan Edwards. I'm the CEO of British American Business. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the latest in our corporate citizenship and sustainability series of discussions. And today we're going to be talking about uh, specifically climate related but also other ESG regulatory reporting requirements uh, in the UK, uh, the EU and the USA. And we have a really terrific panel to help us to unpick this, uh, this topic who will be introduced to you in a moment. First of all, uh, let me um, say huge thanks to our series sponsors as always. Uh, they are Debevoys and Plimpton. EY and United Airlines. So thank you very much indeed for your support. You know, last week um, here in New York City, we hosted a roundtable discussion for our members, US and UK large corporates with the new trade secretary from the UK who was in New York, um, Kemi uh, Badenoch. And amongst many topics that were raised, the issue of the uh, compliance and regulatory reporting burden was raised by multiple companies. Not all of it, not all of it related to climate, of course. There are other regulatory uh, reporting requirements for every business, and this is a huge cost to business, uh, often a, uh, a hidden cost. And uh, uh, there is some concern about the, the mounting scale of this, um, as as uh, we'll hear today, no doubt. Let's hope this is. Uh, doing some good and addressing uh, what are real challenges for the world. House rules today, uh, this is a meeting format, so it's great if you could keep your camera on, if you feel comfortable doing that. Mic off, unless you're speaking. Um, we're going to have a discussion amongst the panel um, to kick off, and then we'd like to hear from you. So we'd like you to make comments or questions. And you can do that in a couple of ways. The, the first is to use the raise hand function. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this now, but there's a, uh, there's a panel at the bottom of your screen. You can raise your hand like that uh, if you'd like to ask a question and we would encourage you to do so live. Alternatively, you can uh, um, put something in the chat, uh, either directed to uh, the moderator or to me or to any of the BAB team or to everyone. So. Uh, Let's make this as interactive as possible. Um, and with that, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, we've, we've distributed the resumes of all of our speakers, so I'm, I don't intend to go through that, but let's say that Ulysses Smith is as well qualified as anybody to uh, moderate this discussion today. He is a senior advisor on ESG issues at Debevoise and Plimpton. Ulysses, thanks for being with us, and I'll pass to you. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, thanks to, to you guys at BAB uh, for hosting us and uh, for this partnership that we value so much. It's really great to be with you all. Um, I'm going to just do a couple short introductory uh, remarks. We have a lot to cover, and we have a, a fantastic panel um, to cover it with, and of course, um, a good turnout with you. Um, and look forward to your questions. Um, it's, I think, a fascinating time for the world of ESG, uh, whether you're looking at Europe, or the UK, the US, um, globally, uh, and it's an amazing time to be um, thinking about the issues that we're here to talk about um, today. I think if, if we all went back about a year, 12 months ago or so, I think the world seemed to be going in this uh, inexorable direction towards a bigger and brighter and more ESG uh, prevalent um, future. And I think in the last nine months or so, um, the picture has become quite a bit more complex and murky. Um, uh, uh, developments happening in the US, if you think about um, uh, some of the state level developments that we've seen over the last handful of months, um, some, some pushback uh, on, on some of the ESG agenda and priority. Um, the picture coming out of uh, this year's proxy season with the shareholder proposals related to ESG um, is full of currents going in one direction and then the other. 
Um, you know, we're seeing a lot uh, happening um, uh, globally on, on, on ESG fronts. Um, and it's just a really uh, amazing and challenging time. And I think it's a time when uh, businesses uh, all over the world, including those in the US and the UK, are really grappling with and struggling to kind of come to understand how the picture is taking shape, where is this all headed, um, what are the specific requirements um, that they're they're going to be subject to? And, and you know, the, the focus of this conversation is really on reporting and disclosure, and there's a lot to get into there. That's one piece of, um, of this overall um, uh, challenging, puzzling puzzle um, that we're that we're dealing with. Um, just to say on the on the reporting side, you know, at a, at a big picture level, um, you know, we're seeing a, a transition away from a world that was predominated by, you know, voluntary uh, reporting frameworks, um, you know, wonderful reporting frameworks, the likes of, you know, the uh, the GRI and UNPRI and SASB and and um, uh, any number of uh, of these of these uh, regimes, um, slowly and now more quickly uh, shifting towards a more heavily regulated uh, uh, framework. And so, you know, of course, we see in Europe. As the front runner on this, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which we'll which we'll hear more about in detail, um, developments coming out of the UK with the um, implementation of the TCFD aligned regulations, and um, of course here in the US, um, developments coming um, out of the uh, out of the SEC and proposed rules on um, on cli climate disclosures, as well as um, pro proposed rules more focused on uh, asset managers and 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 private funds. Um, as well, so uh, a very dynamic um, space uh, uh, in the in the reporting um, arena as well. Um, for the conversation today, I'm really delighted uh, to uh, welcome uh, my colleague Patricia Volhard, um, who is a, a Europe-based partner in our uh, private equity and investment management group. Um, has a wealth of experience advising. Uh, clients across uh, industries and, and across the spectrum on uh, the major European and UK uh, regulatory frameworks. And so we're going to hear from, from Patricia on uh, EU developments and, and the UK. Um, thrilled to have John uh, Colas with us, a partner and uh, vice chairman um, at Oliver Wyman Financial Services uh, America. Um, someone I always learn from when I hear him speak, uh, and I hope you will feel the same way. A um, lot of great insight on uh, the U.S. context. We'll hear uh, from him on the SEC proposed rule in particular. Um, and of course, insights related to climate and financial services uh, in the financial services industry. Um, and then lastly, we have David uh, Wynn, who's the uh, chief product uh, officer at Greenstone, um, who we uh, are very uh, fortunate to have with us to provide some insight on how companies are actually operationalizing all of this um, that we're talking about. So with that, um, I'm happy to hand it over to Patricia first, if we can, if you could get us started um, for some perspective on the EU and UK uh, developments. Over to you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, Ulysses. And uh, hello, uh, everybody. So um, yes, in the EU and actually also in the UK, the approach that um, uh, has been taken by legislators uh, has been to sort of channel the money uh, in the right direction from a sort of climate perspective um, by way of disclosure. So um, the, the, the regulatory frameworks that we have in place here in Europe and are sort of going to further expand over the next few years and in the UK um, are all about uh, disclosure. And the, the main purpose behind that is um, as I think in the U US, and we, we will hear more about that, is to avoid greenwashing, to achieve that we have um, consistency in the, in the terminology as is, it, it is being used and permitting the investors to compare products. Um, that is a, is a very important aspect because there's so much public pressure here um, uh, on the investor side to invest in green products and clean products and um, ESG related products um, that um, th that indeed sort of by way of disclosing what you exactly do. So not only saying that you care about climate and ESG, but 
in fact, by being forced to say exactly what you do about it and being forced to report uh, about your performance on that front on an ongoing basis, um, you're sort of in a, indirectly uh, informs, uh, I guess in, in that, that indirectly informs also your um, investments uh, in a certain way. So what do we have? We have um, uh, in Europe, the, the SFDR, um, the Sustainability uh, Financial uh, Disclosure Regulation, um, that um, is a regime, a disclosure regime that applies to all financial market participants. And so um, the, the way it functions is you have to categorize your products and also as a firm, you can categorize yourself, except whether in case you, you have a certain size, in which case, you, you, you cannot choose um, which category you're in. Um, and depending on which category you choose for your products and you as a firm, you're subject to more or less uh, disclosure requirements. So it really then depends how ambitious you are with your product. The very minimum being that you have to disclose how you integrate ESG risks in your investment decision process and how it could impact the value of your investment. That's sort of the minimum. And from there, you can go further uh, towards you know, doing principal adverse impact analysis or looking how your investment actually has an impact on other ESG factors. Um, and, um, and you can go uh, towards um, making sustainable investments, which uh, under European terms has a very specific definition. Again, sort of not only contributing to a certain objective, but also uh, making sure you're not having a, a material adverse impact on other ESG factors. So that's a system under SFDR, leaving you quite a bit of flexibility. And besides that, and it's very broad, so it applies to financial market participants, but it, it applies to ESG um, altogether. So it could be environmental or social in nature. Uh, you just have to be transparent about it and you choose yourself the bar and about you know, what your target is and about what you will report, if any. Um, and besides that, we have the taxonomy and the taxonomy is sort of something that goes in parallel to the SFDR. And that is indeed only for, for well, it applies to many market participants, stakeholders, not only financial market participants, it also applies to certain portfolio companies. And what it does is if you, it, it sort of defines when something is, or an activity is considered to be environmentally sustainable from a European perspective. It really sets out certain screening criteria and certain activities uh, which will be considered sustainable if they achieve certain uh, certain thresholds and th certain targets and are within the scope of the taxonomy. Uh, for now, um, that only applies to uh, investments or activities that uh, have as an objective climate change mitigation or climate change adaptation. Uh, going forward, uh, other environmental objectives will be added. So, but for now, this is really only climate related. Um, so that's basically what we have in Europe. And whenever you have a fund, for example, you, you have to report under SFDR, you know, you categorize yourself and then you report accordingly. And whatever you do, you have to make a statement whether or not you consider to make taxonomy aligned investments, meaning environmentally sustainable investments where you would screen climate related data if you were within the scope of the taxonomy. Um, in the UK, just a very quick few words on the on the UK, we have a different system in the UK. Um, so the UK has decided not to adopt the um, SFDR uh, and it also not the European taxonomy. That said, the UK is working on, on their own taxonomy, maybe, you know, looking at how things are going in Europe and building in some improvements. Um, but my feeling being less prescriptive maybe than, than the Europeans. But for now, this is still in the making. So there is no UK taxonomy for now. In the UK, you have the Green Taxonomy Advisors Group that is working on it, that working on screening criteria for climate adaptation and climate mitigation. And, um, and it is expected that uh, something will go out um, in, the, in the second quarter 
of uh, um, um, of um, of this. Uh, uh, sorry, in uh, something we'll go out by the end of this year. Um, so, um, what else do we have in the UK? We have what we have already today is the TCFD, and we will hear more about that because it's also quite relevant in the US. The TCFD is the Task Force for Climate Change Related Financial Disclosures. Um, until now, just a voluntary regime, um, uh, uh, but with um, now um, these new developments, the FCA um, has made clear that the TCFD will apply on a mandatory basis to certain uh, participants like uh, regulated MIFID firms, uh, regulated fund managers, and, and so on. And depending on which size they have, they will have to report about their climate change related, how, how they consider climate change related aspects in their management, in risk management, corporate governance, the metrics they apply, and so on, both on an entity level, but also product level. And the reporting will apply or will become mandatory for uh, certain firms that exceed a certain threshold that have uh, 3 billion um, in, uh, in um, assets under management uh, or more uh, over a rolling average of three years um, as of um, the first report will then be due in 2000, uh, June 2024 with the reporting period being in 2023. And for firms that are even bigger, uh, uh, 30 billion um, assets under management, it uh, will apply already in 2023, the first report in June and reporting period uh, 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 being already uh, this year. Um, so um, that, uh, with that, I, I, I would leave it there because I know we have a lot to talk about and maybe happy to answer further questions, but that's just to give you a sort of a quick overview about the regulatory frameworks in place in the UK and in Europe. Terrific. Patricia, thanks so much. That's super helpful um, place to start. Um, and yes, definitely some follow-up questions, I'm sure. Um, but now I think if we can go to, to John, just to continue setting the table um, with what the picture in the US looks like, uh, that'd be helpful to come to you next, John. Uh, sure. Thank you, Ulysses. And thank you, uh, British American Business, Duncan, and the team for hosting us today. Um, so Ulysses, you said in your opening remarks that certainly there's a lot going on and there's certainly a lot of change uh, underway, but I think perhaps the most dramatic uh, and significant development in the recent year has been the SEC's announced proposed rules on climate disclosures. And uh, I think part of the indication around that is the number of comment letters that the SEC has received uh, in, the, in the intervening period from March. So I think the total number of comments is now approximately 15,000. So order of magnitude more than what uh, any proposed rule would typically receive. So the SEC rule is really, I think, something that just reminds us all that climate disclosures are here to stay. Uh, Patricia has alluded to the many different frameworks emerging in the European Union and the United Kingdom. But here in the United States, there's a lot of debate as what will be the final shape of the SEC proposed rule. But nevertheless, investors are demanding and consumers and others are expecting more transparency, more disclosures. And I think for all of us on this call, there's just a general recognition that uh, climate risk disclosures are here to stay. When I step back and look at uh, the proposed rule by the SEC, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with it, I think there are a couple of things that are noteworthy. As Patricia just referenced, um, the TCFD is really something that the SEC referred to and based much of its recommendations and framework on. So to some extent, those firms that have already embraced TCFD have uh, a good starting point. I think it's important to say that while the SEC rule hews closely to the TCFD, uh, there are additional uh, requirements and additional references to things that firms may not yet have in place, even if they have been working on TCFD since 2017. The good news with respect to TCFD is not only is it 
emerging as uh, a de facto market standard. Now over 3,800 companies are supporters of the TCFD. And as Patricia alluded to, there are uh, already eight jurisdictions, including the UK, Singapore, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Japan, who have all mandated TCFD-like disclosures. So to my opening point, uh, climate risk disclosures are here to stay. Uh, with respect to the challenges posed on corporations and all public registrants in the United States with respect to the SEC proposed rule, the real areas that are critical and there's significant work to be done relate to the disclosure of scope three greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as many of you would have read, the rule also says if you have um, develop a transition plan, please disclose that as well. If you've set targets on a net zero journey, please disclose that as well. So there are specific aspects of the SEC rule that uh, are required to respond to, including board and management climate related expertise, uh, frequency of reporting, plans to adapt to specific physical risks, uh, disaggregation of greenhouse gas uh, by each constituent greenhouse gas. So there's a lot, there's a lot in it, uh, and it does represent significant work uh, for the industry. So that said, um, we don't know what the final shape of the rule will be. Um, there have been uh, important points cited in the comment letters. They fall into a number of categories. But I think the most important categories include just simply uh, the complexity and quality of calculating and disclosing scope three emissions. And we'll hear from that. We'll hear more on that from David. Uh, there's just the general uh, expectations with respect to the cost of compliance and making sure the right resources are brought to bear to do a high quality job at the same level as all other financial disclosures. There's some challenges to the legal authority of the SEC in, in promulgating this rule. And then there's also considerations with respect to the 1% threshold and some of the financial statement footnotes. But by and large, you know, we're, we're waiting for the rule to be finalized. Uh, we don't know the final shape that it will take, but nevertheless, you know, our advice and our perspective would be, uh, it behooves all of us to start preparing now uh, and there, there's, you know, a set of imperatives where regardless of the shape of the final rule, it would be advisable for corporations and leaders to embrace. And I would say they start with just an acknowledgement of climate related risks, that if we really believe that climate is a financial risk and must be measured and managed as such, building in capabilities to integrate climate scenarios into uh, strategic planning are really important. Integrating a view of climate related risk into capital management and resource allocation is incredibly important. And so we believe building that scenario analysis and risk management pillar is, is essential. In addition, um, getting going on calculating greenhouse gas emissions, we also think is very important that scope one and scope two emissions are largely reported to, by those participants in, uh, in CDP on a regular basis. The higher quality that we can get on scope one and scope two, the less anxiety there'll be in capturing scope three data, but getting going on greenhouse gas emissions, quantification and reporting we think is important. And then finally, and perhaps you know, the most important is reflecting on transition plans. Ultimately, when we look at this challenge, we don't think of this as a disclosure challenge in and of itself. We believe that ultimately this has to be um, integrated in business strategy. And the reflection of business strategy is going to be articulated in a well-crafted commercially smart transition plan. How will the company thrive in transitioning to that low carbon economy? What are the risks and opportunities that that presents? and being incredibly articulate and buttoned down in terms of the understanding of the implications and conveying that 
uh, to stakeholders, we think is ultimately the most important effort. So I'll pause there, Ulysses, unless um, you'd like me to carry on. No, that's great, John. That's a great that's a great place to start, um, and uh, you know appreciate um, um, all those observations, including you know confirming. Uh, that in fact we do still have uh, only a proposed rule; it hasn't been finalized. And of course, the journey for the the uh, the SEC proposed rule um, may be extended by litigation and, and court challenge. Um, you know, we're expecting that that may be um, in the offing as well. Once we do get a a final rule uh, from the SEC later this year, uh, most likely. Um, and just also to acknowledge, uh, it's not something we're going to really get into in this discussion. Uh, we're focused on. The, uh, the proposed rule from the SEC back in March uh, related to climate disclosures for public you know, uh, companies and, and, and SEC registrants. Um, but the SEC has been very active in its rulemaking this year um, um, on ESG and climate topics, including um, two proposed rules that came in May. Um, one focused on uh, the, um, the funds uh, names rule uh, and, and another um, more focused on disclosures for um, asset managers and and private uh, fund advisors, um, et cetera. So um, Deborah Voice does have a, an ESG resource center on our website that has lots of information, including um, some briefing materials on those proposed rules if those are relevant to you. Um, but Patricia, before we go to, to David, I wanted to just come back to you for one second to pick up on something that uh, John started to allude to a, a, a bit. Um, um, you know, the TCFD is uh, a common um, ancestor, I think, for a number of these different frameworks. Um, uh, uh, you know, the SEC does cite TCFD and its um, proposed rule. Um, and I'm just curious for your thoughts, you know, on the extent to which, from a practical point of view, um, there is alignment between these different regulatory frameworks. If you're a, a global uh, company that's subject to regulation in, in the UK, the US, and Europe, and elsewhere, you know, will there be the ability to kind of kill two or three birds with one stone, so to speak, or is it going to be a, a sort of divergent um, landscape, do, do you expect? And I appreciate that the SEC proposed rule is still a proposal. We don't have it finalized yet. But what are your thoughts on that before we go to David? Yeah, I, 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 well, I wouldn't, I would definitely not say divergent, um, but um, whether it really is killing, um, a killing uh, how do you say it, three birds, with two stones or so, that, that I'm not so sure. Because um, first of all, I mean, TCFD, the scope um, is sort of in a way limited because, you know, as I said, it's only mandatory for firms uh, with assets under management of 5 billion or, you know, um, even earlier for um, firms with assets under management of 50 billion. But but um, but even even that sort of the uh, the, the European regulation is uh, broader. Um, it sort of it, it it provides for any kind of ESG and criteria, and so you can sort of qualify your fund as an Article Eight or Nine fund, an ESG related fund or impact fund. Um, even without having any climate change related uh, um, aspect in there. That said. If you are, from a European perspective, a fund that qualifies, for example, as a fund making sustainable investments or even a taxonomy aligned fund, so a fund that falls within uh, with its economic activity within the taxonomy and has as an objective climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation, then I think you would be in a very good position uh, to also fulfill all the criteria under TCFD. Um, you know, your reporting under TCFD, I think, should be relatively straightforward then because you comply with relatively strict disclosure requirements uh, in, in Europe. That said, TCFD goes beyond a little bit reporting. Of course, they, um, they, the, you also have to report how you include it in risk management and your governance and so on. But, um, but generally, I think that would be sort of an alignment and it is clearly going in, in the same direction. And also in the US, if I look um, at the, you know, also just proposed rules out there, um, we do see that the SEC is also, of course, proposing uh, categorization of funds. 
uh, climate uh, funds, um, ESG integration funds, ESG related funds, and then impact funds, which is kind of the same categorization we have here in Europe. And depending on which category you're in, um, I would suspect that uh, disclosure requirements will vary. And the, 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 the purpose being exactly the same as in Europe, um, we want to avoid greenwashing, we want to achieve consistency in, in the terminology that we apply, and we want to uh, permit uh, investors to compare products in a certain way. Um, and so I think from that perspective, there is certainly uh, uh, an overlap that we can work with pretty well, um, but, um, but not one-to-one, -one, of course, so. Um. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I know there has been a lot of talk about um, trying to align, and, and that's been um, an idea that's been in, in people's minds. Obviously, that would be very helpful, but um, yeah, we'll have to see how it all shakes out. Um, David, thanks for waiting uh, patiently for us. Now, if we can come to you, uh, it'd be really wonderful to hear a bit more about you know your the businesses you're working with and how you're helping, um, helping companies uh, operationalize uh, these reporting rubrics. Over to you. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for the invite. Um, so I'm David Wynn. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Greenstone. We are a sustainability software company. So we were founded back in 2007 when mandatory carbon reporting came into the UK. Um, so we have a long history of working with companies to provide them software solutions to help manage this ESG landscape. And Having done that for a decade in the UK, I moved to New York last year to open our US office. Um, and thanks to BAB for the great resources that helped us with that process. We see day to day uh, the challenges uh, that organizations have navigating this messy ESG world of disclosure. Um, and it's no surprise that in the last couple of years, the role of technology in ESG has boomed in terms of looking at how software can help better enable businesses to aggregate data, analyze data, report data uh, within this landscape. So we've really seen the movement of this type of reporting uh, move from being often a project within a business to a process. Um, so companies will often start out thinking about ESG reporting as maybe one person's project or role. Um, and now the maturity of many organizations is it's really about embedding processes to efficiently manage that information. It's certainly been interesting, um, you know, I've been with Greenstone 10 years and working with organizations in the EU and the UK for a long time on the sustainability journey and the improvements of data in terms of coverage and quality. Now working increasingly with organizations in North America, you know, it, it's a very different landscape in terms of the ambition and appetite to report. Um, obviously, the SEC is driving some of that. Um, but a lot of organizations are at that nexus of struggling between high ambition and a lack of resources or knowledge within the business on how to get there. Um, so that's really where we come in from a technology standpoint is to help underpin the process of this data. And this data is becoming ever increasingly important for disclosure, it's becoming required, it's having legal implications. And so the way that companies are treating the data um, is much more similar to financial data in terms of how it's verified and audited. Um, and the implications of the data being incorrect um, are all the more uh, important and serious than, than they have been historically. The other part I just thought I would touch on in terms of opening is around scope three emissions. Um, so those are the greenhouse gas emissions that sit outside of direct control in your operations. And so that is um, really one of the biggest areas of focus for many businesses in terms of thinking about the specific data and in all those thousands of um, feedback 
uh, letters that went to the SEC on their proposed rules and thinking about TCFD, um, you know, far and away, a lot of those, I'm sure, will be addressing the, the concept of scope three emissions and how companies can do that. Um, so from a data management standpoint, you know, that's one area where we see this maturity curve um, again and again. So particularly for North America organizations, you know, a lot of what we do is we're working with them on that education of that because it's about squaring out the reporting requirements and the business's ambitions with the, the actual steps involved um, to really kind of ensure that that scope three data um, is of quality to then be able to underpin setting targets and disclosing it to stakeholders um, within that. So yeah, just a couple of key that points that I wanted to, to raise there and happy to obviously further the conversation on any of the sort of more operational uh, trends that we're seeing from organizations. Ulysses, uh, there's one question maybe we should address immediately that came in on TCFD and the scope. Um, maybe just to sort of clarify, the, the, the scope that I defined was really just, you know, relevant to the FCA rules that become now mandatory for a certain financial market participants in the UK, and the FCA rules are based on the TCFD, whereas you already have the TCFD that currently is voluntary and mandatory to certain firms in the UK in place, including you know, normal portfolio companies exceeding a certain size. So having more than 500 employees and a turnover of 500 million, um, those are already enlisted companies are already subject to TCFD annual reporting requirements today. So I think that's important to um, clarify. Thank you, sorry, you're the No, 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 that was great. I was that. actually, we've got a couple of good questions here. I wanted, it was gonna to come to those. Um, um, there's also another one, and maybe, I don't know, John, if you want to speak to this, uh, there's a question um, uh, about carbon offsets and the SEC proposed rule. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, obviously, the proposed rule is still as it was when it was proposed, so there haven't been changes yet. Um, I have definitely been tracking the comments. Um, this is an issue, though, that I don't know that I've seen a lot of comments um, touch upon, but, um, but basically, the disclosed rule requires a certain amount of disclosure around the extent to which carbon offsets are being used um, in the in the climate um, calculations. But and anyway, John, I don't know if you have any uh, yeah. insight to add for that to that question. Sure, I would just add, uh, Ulysses, and it sort of builds on my point around transition plans and targets. So the SEC rule says if you have a transition plan, disclose it. If you've set net zero targets, disclose them. But with respect to your transition plan and specifically with your targets, if you are using uh, carbon offsets or renewable energy credits or other forms of offsets, those are all meant to be disclosed. So you, you have to think about the SEC as really wanting transparency and clarity. And it's not saying you can't use offsets, but you need to be transparent in what those are. Great. I think that, that makes sense. Um, there was also a, a request to share uh, online content to read more about the, the proposed um, uh, SEC rules. And I was trying to uh, quietly pull up a couple of links that I could that I could post, but maybe Emma, I don't know, or if someone at BAB, if I could forward you something um, you could post, that would be that would be great. Um, and just to encourage uh, the audience I, I, to please submit questions. Um, I've got a few, of course, myself, but um, would love to hear from you. And if you wanna raise your hand or, or put your question in the chat, um, we'll definitely come on to that. Um, Duncan, I think I see your hand uh, raised. Yeah, thanks. So I just wanna pick up on the, um, so I, I was the one who posted that, that point in the, in the chat about who's going to be required uh, to mandatory, mandatorily report under TCFD. And I'm just curious, because I, I don't follow the um, uh, sort of EU regulation uh, that closely, but is there an equivalent there that there is going to be mandatory climate change reporting for regular companies rather than just, you know, financial market participants, investment advisors, investment funds, and so on? Um, so, and, and, and yeah. so how, how, how deeply is this requirement going to go? I mean, if you're just tackling the investment 
industry that's one thing but it's the underlying you know, yeah. investee companies that, that that clearly we represent largely so i'm just curious what's what what is likely to come in the EU? And, and and similar question to john again i'm not 100 percent sure i understand the the scope of the sec requirement whether it applies to you know regular companies private companies uh, and is there a de minimis level uh, below which it doesn't apply Thank you, Duncan. I think that's an excellent question. Um, so maybe just sort of as a general comment, I think the reason why they start in Europe really uh, with the within you know the financial market participants is because these give the money to the companies and um, sort of make it as you know the the hope is that um, in their due diligence process and when making an investment decision. They, they sort of impose or encourage the companies to behave in a certain manner and provide certain data going forward, implement certain procedures and so on. But that said, we, we, we have in Europe, um, the idea is to apply that, the taxonomy really as the key regulation to all stakeholders going forward. We have already today, like in the UK, in fact, the UK is sort of still based on the European rules um, when they were still you know, part of the European Union, the, the non-financial disclosure uh, regulation or directive, which um, sort of uh, imposes uh, on listed companies and certain large companies and insurance companies to provide non-financial reporting, which going forward also includes reporting under the taxonomy, so the climate change related uh, uh, reporting. Um, so, so, and that directive will be further expanded under the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, so it will include not only listed going forward, but also larger private companies. And, and then I think the idea is also, you know, in the longer term, uh, smaller companies. And in addition, there's another directive, which then provides that it's called the Corporate uh, Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, again, applying to all companies, financial or non-financial, and they have to in place a certain regime to take into account supply chain and environmental aspects. So uh, your, your question is absolutely right. You know, how, how does it really impact at the portfolio company? level it's coming one from the funding side because the, the the people investing in those companies will ask for certain things but then at the same time there is also regulation that um uh, sort of kicks in at, at the portfolio company level exactly the same way and in that case it's really the taxonomy which is climate change related at the at, at this moment uh, uh that that is important and relevant yep thank you yeah and then, Duncan, I would just add, for the SEC proposed rule, it applies to all public you, uh, you, all public SEC registrants, uh, where, um, you know, it gets a little bit more, um, you know, tailored, if you will, is the time horizon. So large accelerated filers are going to be required uh, currently under the proposed rule uh, to uh, begin the reporting uh, in the first fiscal year after the rule is finalized. Uh, the next category is referred to as accelerated and non-accelerated filers, which would be uh, beginning with the second full fiscal year after the rule is finalized. And then smaller reporting companies would be in the third year. Um, and so with respect to private companies, you know, the, the more likely way that this will impact or affect them is that should the scope three emissions requirement remain in place, then it will be, uh, it will ripple through supply chains and that large companies will turn to their supply chain and want to understand the emissions of their uh, partners. And then oftentimes those might be small or middle market companies who would then uh, need, need or perhaps be requested to provide emissions data to them so that the company can include them in their scope three emissions. And so in that regard, uh, it would have, uh, 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 it wouldn't be a direct requirement on private companies or small companies, but there would be sort of an indirect cascading that would not naturally follow. 
and some companies some private companies might choose to disclose as well i suppose like like yeah. they did like some private company large private companies under sarbanes oxley weren't required to disclose but did yeah exactly yeah i mean that, that's exactly right like it doesn't you don't need the sec to uh you know dictate whether someone wants to track their greenhouse gas emissions and share them with its supply chain right yeah i'd agree with that and i think you know there was over the last 10 15 years in the uk and eu there was waiting for a lot of legislation and actually it's been business and investors that have really driven a lot of that we work with a lot with private equity firms who are looking to gather this esg data from their portfolio companies in private markets and so business has the agility to be able to act quickly and use things like TCFD to inform structures. Um, so I think it is a sort of one, two in terms of both the regulatory side, but also these large um, financial markets being driven by the investor community. And just a couple more uh, uh, points just to say, you know, in terms of, you know, if you're, if you're a private company, you can't uh, tune these out um, safely. I mean, for one thing, many private companies aspire to one day become public companies through an IPO. Um, they're going to, you know, have to sort of grapple with 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 the with the requirements um, if and when you know they want to get to that stage. Um, I do think there, you know, is very likely to be a more generalized kind of raising of standards. Um, the market is just going to become accustomed to having more of this information out there and basing um, you know, decisions on that information. And so even if not necessarily required by the SEC, um, a lot of your investors, a lot of you know, uh, the other market participants are going to expect to see this information. I think it also has um, a, a potential impact on financing and sort of the kinds of things that banks are going to want to finance and invest in and what they're going to expect to see in order to, because obviously they've got to deal with their own scope three um, uh, emissions considerations, and that's going to reach down most likely into, um, into, um, into the, the companies that they're, that they're, uh, financing. So there, I think are any number of indirect kind of more indirect, uh, effects that we can expect to see even for private companies. Um, on that, I want to just quickly be mindful of the questions we've come in. I see that we have, uh, uh, posted some 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 reading um, uh, in the chat, which is very helpful. Um, there's also a question. I think this is uh, also from you, Duncan. Do you want to speak up, or should I just read your question? <laughs> I'm I'm happy to ask it. I I just uh, it's an endlessly fascinating topic. So I'm just curious what what the panel is seeing in terms of how companies are approaching this as a as a as a piece of work. Um, you know, who's handling this in general, you know, is it typically coming out of general counsel's office or CFO's office? Are companies trying to manage it in-house? Presumably the reason you guys are all here is because they're also using outsourced help as well. So I'm just curious what you're mm -hmm. seeing. Are there any generalities? Because it's a, an enormous amount of work. And um, meanwhile, of course, companies are trying to run their businesses. Yeah, and it varies hugely. So, you know, often for companies that are coming to this from a regulatory standpoint of, okay, now we have to report this, um, you know, it can be general counsel or it's legal or communications that are maybe having that first engagement point. Um, so a lot of when we were thinking about working with people on software and the data and what's needed, um, particularly for these newer organizations, and a lot of what I do is explaining the journey of, okay, this is what the journey is going to look like for you as a business. And therefore, these are the resources and tools and structures that you'll need in place to be able to report this. Um, like I say, treating it as a project rather than a process can be fine for year one but you know it's really not going away um and then often initially it'll be a part of a person's time that has a sustainability remit of okay can you pull the data together and then um, over time that resourcing will come in as this importance and value of the data comes into play i think the other part of it is reporting and disclosure is 
fantastic, but it's more important that businesses are able to operationalize change. And so having the ability to analyze data and actually implement change then becomes the maturity curve beyond just disclosing these numbers publicly. And therefore, you know, additional resources will often come into play to be able to facilitate that. Yeah, and Duncan, I would add to David's comments that essentially this is a highly, you know, multifunctional collaborative effort, right? So when you look at the journey that most firms have undergone with respect to sustainability or ESG more broadly, oftentimes the initiative has come initially out of a corporate social responsibility function. And then over time, as, as the awareness of the impact of climate has uh, sort of emerged, then risk teams have become involved. And now when you start to look at the importance of disclosures, uh, the CFO team has to be involved. And when you broaden that, now when you look at the attestation requirements under the proposed rules, the audit team has to be involved. When you look at the reporting uh, and communications, the investor relations teams have to be involved. So this really takes the shape of sort of a multifunctional team. Oftentimes it's anchored in the CFO because it's so important to get your financial disclosures, right? Uh, but again, no one has done this yet, right? So it's still, I think, you know, an exercise that people are assembling sort of that, that broad base of capabilities and bringing together strategy, risk, finance, investor relations, communications, all together to really drive uh, and integrate not just the disclosure effort, but the strategy and commercial opportunities that arise from the insights. And I think I've got, it's a great... I've got a lot of friends in, in marketing, but I wouldn't want them responsible for my data disclosure. Yeah, and I think it's a great example of the, the British American side of things, right? So in terms of leveraging the experience of the journeys of the EU and UK businesses that have reported for a long time and really kind of understand the importance of what this needs to look like, the stakeholders involved, those ESG roles, which are really about the translation of data and coordination within there. I see a lot of um, US businesses looking at this fresh and starting saying, you know, where do I begin? What do I need to look like? And so we can draw from colleagues and cultural understanding from markets that have are mature um, to just really kind of, you know, leverage the experience um, elsewhere. Just one other thing to um, just to mention because we haven't really we touched upon it, but we didn't we haven't really dug into it. But the issue of greenwashing and um, and you know in the U.S. context in particular, you know how um, that has become a real priority focus uh, area um, of the SEC. You know, last year there was uh, the creation of this uh, specific task force within the enforcement arm of the SEC, looking at climate and ESG related disclosures. Um, you know, essentially looking for, you know, uh, situations where climate commitments or achievements have been exaggerated in some way or misrepresented. Um, and we're starting to see, um, you know, some of the first uh, cases coming out of that, that task force uh, in the last, you know, six to nine months or so. Um, so just, uh, I guess, maybe a little bit of a plug for the lawyers in the room as well. Um, you know, these issues are uh, creating legal uh, exposure. Um, uh, through disclosures, obviously, it's a, it's a, as I mentioned at the top, a, you know, increasingly more heavily regulated space. The governance of ESG and climate is is uh, more and more subject to law and regulation. Um, and so, I think you're also seeing, you know, the general counsels and and, and the legal teams um, coming in as well. I think I'm usurping um, the panels space here. I'm not being a very quiet moderator. Apologies there. But, um, do we have any other questions um, or or anything else uh, um, to come to? I I guess I if if not, and and I'm happy to be guided by you, Duncan or Emma, um, but I have just a very sort of big picture question. And if anyone's interested in answering it, great. If not, no worries, we can leave it. But just thinking about sort of the ultimate objective of all of this, right, is, you know, in some ways getting the business community onto a path that is, you know, uh, leading to contributing to a more sustainable future for, for the earth and 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 for our world. And you know, disclosure and providing information to the market so that the market can make 
informed decisions around investments um, that's taking into account, uh, you know, climate impact and 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 diversity and inclusion and all these things. Um, you know, ultimately, that is sort of the the goal. And so, I guess my question to the panelists, um, as we're getting close to the end, is, you know, do we feel like the regulations and these reporting regimes are they contributing to kind of getting onto that path? You know, are there ways in which it's counterproductive? Um, you know, how do you feel like this is all adding up to uh, helping to get to the ultimate goal? Um, if you want to take that up, I'd you know love to hear from you guys. But if not, we can hand it back to to Duncan and the team. Look, I, I, I might take sort of a first uh, try of answering this. Um, I think in Europe, uh, we, there, there's a lot of you know critical voices about this new regulation because there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about very substantial things like what do we mean by consider what's the exact scope what uh, really you know important and with that goes quite a you know important uh, liability exposure of firms of sort of misrepresenting uh, in the documentation and so on so um you know people there some people who are frustrated and upset there are others who are quite um, happy that this is going in that direction. And um, quite honestly, I do think that this regulation will have, will change things. And I'm seeing that it does. In fact, um, I see that uh, clients, I mean, I'm a funds lawyer, so obviously I see uh, mainly fund sponsors, uh, but I, I do see them sort of, they're, they're thinking, I mean, they all cared about ESG before, but now it's much more concentrated, it's much more concrete, it's, it's, they're being forced to disclose and there's so much public pressure because that's what investors want to see. And also um, portfolio companies, if we talk about portfolio companies here in Europe at least, and it's the same in the UK, clients really want to see you know, the, the, the climate related aspects of their products, they do care about these things. And, and so I think it's a big target marketing tool. And, and, and that's why I, I think, you know, forcing them to do proper disclosure and using the same terminology uh, will have a certain effect. I, I do believe in that, in, in, in that, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would just echo Ulysses that I think when you look at all the proposed rules and all the activity that's going on, you know, at the core, what we're really saying is two things. One, markets function better with better information. And two, you know, one of the consequences um, that has led, or one of the causes of climate change is greenhouse gas emissions. It's an externality that we've never truly accounted for. So providing that information is going to help us make better decisions with respect to investing in new technologies, allocating resources, and the, that transparency. And as Patricia has alluded to, some of the standardization of the reporting will help make better decisions uh, for society. So I, I think the benefit is positive. Uh, and you know, we're still in the early days as to what the final rules will look like. But nevertheless, the view is provide better information to the markets and we'll be better at managing the world's resources. I agree. And I think greenhouse gas emissions are, I was gonna say greenhouse gas emissions are great. They're obviously not great, they're terrible, but they're great in the sense that it gives us a common unit to be able to aggregate on the E side of things. And if companies start there, regulations will change. This space has been messy for a very long time in terms of requirements on businesses. And yes, there's been some convergence and hopefully there will be more, but the landscape is messy. So focusing on transparency, what's important for the business um, and those key data points is really, you know, you can't go wrong in terms of building good foundations. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you all for this fantastic discussion. Um, I know we're just about at time, so I want to hand it back over to Duncan. But again, thanks for having us, Duncan and BAB. It's been a really great conversation. Well, thanks very much. And Ulysses, thanks to you for uh, brilliantly moderating that discussion. Uh, clearly, we, we, it's a huge topic and we could have spent a lot more uh, time on this uh, than just the hour that we had, but we did cover a lot of ground. So I'm very grateful to Patricia, John, uh, David, and of course to you, Ulysses, for doing that. Um, it, it's, an, it's an issue we're going to return to in our sustainability series. We, we, we have many events on this subject and the broader 
uh, ESG environment for companies, um, financial sponsors, regulators, and others. Um, we also, it's, it's fair to say, we have a lot of carbon intensive or carbon heavy companies in our membership. And uh, most companies, most CEOs are trying to do the right thing, but this transition is not easy. And it's gonna be a kind of slow and difficult challenge for, for large corporations to get through. But uh, human, human ingenuity is amazing. And uh, we think that they, they, they will get through it. So anyway, more to come on that. Thanks all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you at a British American business event soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.